Hey everybody, welcome to Alpha Flight Monday and Dad's Den of Pop Culture. Alpha Flight number 45, From Out of the Grave. Great cover, I will say that. What about the interior? Well, let's find out. Stanley presents Resurrection. Um, we have this image of these kind of crystal coffins with Doug with Snowbird in the Sasquatch form and their child. Man, that's a sad, uh, yeah, you know, as a parent, you don't like to see that. Uh, written by Bill Mantlo, uh, pencils by June Brigman, inks Will Spatasio, uh, letters Jim Novak, I almost said Kim Novak. <laughs> you know, after a long acting career, she said, what the hell? Time to letter some comic books. Uh, Colors, Bob Sharon, Carl Potts, editor, Jim Shooter, editor-in-chief. So Alpha is obviously having a funeral for their fallen. Pestilence killed Doug McKenzie. Um, was it Doug McKenzie? Wait. It wasn't Doug McKenzie, right? That's the McKenzie brothers. By golly, I <laughs> Doug Thompson, there it is. <laughs> well, they're both Canadian. Um, so Heather is thinking about what happened last issue with her having sort of having to kill Shaman, um, after Shaman kills Pestilence, who was sort of possessing the body of her own son. Pestilence escapes as a spirit. She's not feeling real good. And though Puck tries to comfort her, she instead goes to Madison Jeffries and Puck feels dejected and is down on himself as usual. I, I wish they'd done more for Puck than they did. Um, what can I say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were opportunities, many, for character growth in the series. And sometimes they'd start having that, and then they wouldn't. It was a little bit of a treadmill, and sometimes it kind of bums me out. Kara is dealing with death for the first time. This is a bad, bad day for Alpha Flight. And um, sadly, also uh, issues that probably could have been, uh, it probably could have turned out differently. Choices were made. And sometimes they make it seem like they didn't have any choices. They really did. And that, you know, I said kind of for a while, this is like the band that never could never shoot straight um, or the gang that could never shoot straight. Um, it's a, it's an interesting comic in that regard. Although sometimes, sometimes it feels as though it's not a story that's being told of people who are honestly not that great at the hero business, doing their best and dealing with their failures. Sometimes it feels more like the writer forgot what they were doing or the writer wrote something in that was a little bit out of character um, you know, which a, a, a more adult, maybe sort of bleak storyline is fine. Sometimes it doesn't feel that way though. So they're thinking about others who have died and Aurora's thinking about Walter Lankowski who passed away. He was the original Sasquatch. They were a couple and, um, North Star still dealing with the cough, you know, it was you and he, North star loves his sister, but he can also be a bit of a jerk. And he says to her, uh, it was you, uh, who drove him to do it. Aurora, you who threatened <coughs> to choose a living lover while Lenkowski was trapped inside box. You have <coughs> threatened to do the same to Roger box who now inhabits the robot. You may be my brother North star, but that gives you no right, no right. <coughs> To con no right to condemn your fickle flirtations that drive men to court death for your love. And he's he's not speaking, you know, a lie there. That has been an issue with the Aurora personality. And, you know, earlier in the series, she was getting help uh, from a psychologist and, or a psychiatrist. And, uh, and that ended at some point along the way and probably shouldn't have. So Talisman calls on the gods. Um, Snowbird is a demigoddess, but she has been barred 
from, well, we'll just call it heaven because of her marriage and having a child with uh, a mortal. So kind of like Sam from Bewitched. And um, so he basically is like, please let her in. And she asks for forgiveness, you know, um, and, and she, or, well, they're saying, you know, ask for forgiveness and we will forgive you. And she says, no, mother, not so long as the gods reject my mortal husband and Timmy God's son. I loved Doug Thompson when I married him and would have gone on loving him had you not stripped me of my immortality and forced me to choose between my husband and paradise. To my shame, I almost chose the latter and they perished because of it. Now their souls must rise with mine. And ultimately, Shaman works that out. And they permit it, even though they're hesitant. And so, Snowbird and Doug Thompson and their son are going to go live in paradise with the gods. Okay, and that tempers the sadness of what happened to them a bit, um, you know, for sure. And so Shaman says, let their bodies be buried, for they are now mere soulless shells. And Madison Jeffries has some, you know, machines that'll do that. And so Heather says, I don't feel so guilty now. In the end, death brought Snowbird and her loved ones together. Maybe if you guys had made some other choice. Anyways, well, I guess Doug Thompson had died because of pestilence. But, you know, Alpha really could have gone after pestilence instead of just saying, well... We got other things to deal with. And Shaman says, in the aftermath of their deaths, the time has come for the talisman to take his leave of Alpha. Then you've decided, you decided, Vindicator, when you ordered me to obey you. As Shaman, I might have been able to go on, but having become the binder of spirits, talisman, I find I can heed no mortal commands. But what shall I tell your daughter, Elizabeth, that although I have abandoned this earthly plane, I will love and watch over her forever? Two Alphans gone in <clears throat> one day. But maybe another has returned, eh? And they're seeing like a, a boat or something over there. So again, you know, this is, I mean, well, he's the talisman. He's lost his emotions. It actually makes sense. But it's a, it's a sad departure for Shaman. Great character. But oh my gosh, they just had him going again on sort of a treadmill of guilt over things and losing his powers and regaining his powers. And it's like, you know, you're almost 50 issues in and you don't feel like they've really advanced the character at all. And they really should have. And so it is getting a little frustrating. Well, anyways, they rush back and uh, the boat is from the new life clinic. It has gotten to the Island. And um, again, Aurora is thinking about Roger box who she's been dallying with. And, you know, you know, toying with the legless Roger was a diversion, but I am too much woman for half a man. Oof, man. There's a lot of jerkiness uh, in Alpha Flight. Um, and, and they've, I think they've leaned into that a little bit more with some of the characters other than North Star. But they're amazed when they get back to find that Roger Box is now, um, he has legs, he's muscular, etc. He's been reshaped by, uh, by Scrambler. And um, he's wearing a really upsetting onesie. You know, that, hey, okay, I get it, Roger. You want to show off the bod, but, uh, you know, I don't know. How about some skin-tight jeans? That would uh, probably be enough. At any rate, so uh, Aurora is quite delighted. Hey, he's beautiful. That's what she wants. So um, they're not really seeing any character development for Aurora here either. And, of course, he's really, really, really happy about this and Puck is going could scramble cure me of my dwarfism as anodyne once did referring to the x-men alpha flight special edition number one and could heather then love me well it's not that simple with Puck, as we will definitely find out so he's carrying her off to you know probably just you know talk and tell secrets i'm sure nothing else is going on and off scramble goes, and they're being observed by the tiny little smart Alec. Well, night falls, and 
Sasquatch emerges from the grave. The dead rise. Ooh, what's going on with that? And Heather Hudson is unaware of this, of course. I mean, I guess she would be if you're not looking out at the graveyard. And um, she's, again, kind of thinking of how she's gotten here, um, you know, and thinking about her former husband, or you know, who's passed away. And again, going over the whole thing, maybe he's cold-blooded and he created Wolverine. And there's like, you're going, dude, she has this memory of one file folder on his desk. And she has created this entire fantasy of how Mac was maybe kind of a monster. And they won't drop this. And it just, to me, it doesn't work. It's pushed too hard. Also, by the way, you could ask Wolverine. You know him. Ask Logan. You could have asked him right then and there. Were your bones given to you by Mac? And he could have gone, no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, done. So that one that one bugged me when they first introduced it, and it bugs me now. I, again, I think you could do that, but you need to have it based on more than just a memory from years ago of a, a single file folder on a desk. You know, it just, maybe if she could find that, you know, maybe she should have gone on an adventure to find that, I don't know, but of course that would have that would have ended it because Mac did not create Wolverine. And at this point, we didn't quite know who did at any rate. While all that's going on, she sees the tiny little smart Alec. And um, she throws this lamp at him and he's going, Heather, wait, I'm not who you think. But the tiny voice is unheard and she's trying to, you know, get him. She especially hates him because Omega Flight is who killed Mac, who she thinks might be a monster. So I'm not sure. Yeah. I, you know, you get inconsistencies between writers, but like here we get inconsistencies, it seems like from page to page once in a while. So she catches Smart Alec, you know, and talk, you little creep. I've been trying to, Heather, if you'll just give me a chance, but. Before they get that chance, Sasquatch, who's supposed to be dead, busts through the wall and throws her across the room. And of course, she's, you know, not in her, her battle suit, so she's not protected. Uh, but fortunately, it doesn't, you know, just completely take her out. And so Smart Alec lands next to the box armor that's been left standing there. The others run down, and now they see... Sasquatch fighting Box. Something's possessing her corpse. That is a mystery, Mr. Jeffries, which I suggest we solve after Heather is out of danger, eh? So we get this awesome leap by Puck, who gets slashed along the way along his back, and he rescues Heather again. But, you know, Puck's no good, so what the heck. But in the other, the other big question, of course, is, at this point, well, who's in the armor? Because there's Roger Box. So what is going on here? And Heather says, I'm beginning to guess. Just before Sasquatch burst in, I was hunting Smart Alec, the evil Omegan who Shaman imprisoned. Exactly. Shaman left his bag here when he departed his talisman. And Smart Alec emerged. But with whose mind? There was another soul floating free in the other dimensional void searching for a body to inhabit so he could return to Earth. It cannot be. Hello, beautiful, miss me? The voice, though processed through the circuitry of the box armor, is unmistakably that of Walter Lankowski. You know, I mean, I'm actually cool with this um, because I was kind of bummed that they ever got rid of Walter Lankowski. I really liked him. As Sasquatch, there's going to be an interesting twist to this story, of course which we'll get to momentarily. Um, so they're amazed. And then, of course, surely, dear girl, you do not think you could so easily banish the unslayable soul of pestilence. And with that one word, Heather McNeil Hudson's self-confidence does a nosedive, which, again, is an issue with, with her. By the way, um, I love Brigman's art. It's, it's, it's really good. Um, I'm trying to think if this is the first one. I think she did another issue. 
but she's going to become the regular uh, penciler here for a while. Um, I think she does a fantastic job with the characters and she's especially good. I think also with doing them um, in sort of non super heroic moments, um, she does some good, good face work and all that kind of stuff. So we basically get a big battle here between pestilence as Sasquatch and, um, and the box robot inhabited by Walter Lankowski. Kara almost gets injured. Now, this is another thing to bring up um, because of a future, something we're going to see in a few issues. Kara, when Purple Girl, when she joins the team, they say she's 13 years old. This does not look like a 13-year-old. And I think they maybe kind of regretted that. And without saying anything, I think they've aged her up. I would put her more... She seems more like maybe 16, 17 years old, um, if not in maturity, at least in, you know, her physical form. She does seem a lot older to me than a 13-year-old. That's going to be important later on. So the battle continues. And um, so we, we have a couple interesting things here. Um, one is uh, with box trying to deal with this Sasquatch. I once occupied the box armor too, Heather. I know its strengths. It's might not half that of Sasquatch's. But Box's power lies in more than the armor's strength. Get close to Pestilence, Walter, and don't let go. You would risk my man while you seek safety? And Roger Box is like, my man? Wait a minute. Am I am I being dumped after I've just gotten this new bod? What? Well, Aurora is rather fickle, isn't she? And so he, um, Box basically kind of bear hugs Pestilence there and releases, you know, channels out electricity from his power pack to, um, to stun Pestilence. And this causes Pestilence to flow out of the Sasquatch form. When he does, Heather, who has grabbed the medicine pouch, casts it at him. And the realm of the eternal soul sucks pestilence in. And he is now trapped inside the medicine pouch. That's a nice move. I like it. And again, I like the art here. It works. It, it works well. So they've dealt with pestilence. And as a result, Walter Lankowski takes the form or possesses the body of Sasquatch. So he's sort of back in his Sasquatch form, which is groovy. And Puck is noticing that Smart Alec, there's nothing in him anymore. He's just a light, he's like a vegetable again, like he like he had been after he had looked in the medicine pouch and lost his mind. And so Walter is just thrilled to have Aurora back in his arms, and she's thrilled too, and Roger is completely PO'd. And he goes, I'm sorry about poor Alec. It was his body that got me out of limbo, but he had no mind to use it with, so say la vie. And I'm right back where I started, Sasquatch again despite the color shift. And you can transform back into my beautiful Walter. I don't see why not. Walter? Ma chère, ma chérie. And you notice <laughs> the smirk on his face. I don't understand. Well, you should understand. I mean, you figured out everything else pretty darn easily. Well, see, he's taken over the form of Sasquatch, but that wasn't the original Sasquatch with Walter's body. That was Snowbird. So apparently White Fur was not the only change Walter Lankowski inherited in assuming Snowbird's Sasquatch form. Well, that should be kind of obvious. So Walter Lankowski is now a woman. And isn't that an interesting little twist? Okay. Overall, um, there's, some again, some inconsistencies that are annoying. Overall, I, I do like this issue. You know, uh, there's some stuff where you go, well, it's a little convenient, but it is a comic book. That's not too odd for comic books. Um, it's not a bad It's not a bad story overall, and I do like the art. So I think I like this issue better than the last one. Um, 
but um, we're still heading into some choppy waters. Let me know in the comments what you think of this issue. I'd love to hear from you. If you would, um, if you enjoyed it, uh, the video, please like, subscribe, share with a friend. Um, and until next time, God bless everybody. Please be kind with to one another and with one another. Have a little bit of fun. I will hopefully see you again soon in Dad's Den of Pop Culture. Bye-bye.